I think actually the first time I saw you speak was in 2019 at Breaking Convention, where you gave a talk on sexual abuse in the kind of ayahuasca world. And that's a topic I wanted to, um, yeah, to talk to you about, because I think it's, uh, it's, I guess, important to get information out there. Like what, what kind of advice would you give for people for kind of navigating, uh, you know, this world, if they're, if they're going to a retreat in, uh, in South America, uh, yeah. What, what should people be aware of? Yeah, this is one of the uh, products of Chukruna that I am more proud of. I recommend everybody read our um, sexual abuse awareness guidelines that is published on our website, chukruna.net. And this is uh, these guidelines have been published, I think, maybe, I, I, I don't know if 10 languages or so. We, we translated it to a bunch of languages. We also have the legal resources uh, that... Uh, accompanying them and give tips on legal issues or places to find support. And we also are doing a survey now about it, this topic and people experiencing um, some kind of sexual abuse. So I think, um, you know, there are many tips to give, but basically to research where you're going and be sure of um, the, the, try to go with a friend and uh, have credentials of the people that are uh, involved. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of details. A lot of shamans have like talked to women. It's not just men and women, but mostly, but it also happens on the other way around or between some gen genders, but this idea that to, to do healing, you have to be touched that the, or, you know, take your underwear off. This kind of thing doesn't exist. Also, a lot of healers have said things like, oh, if you don't do this, this your healing is going to be interrupted and you're not going to be healed. Or, or also just talk women into uh, doing all kinds of things because that would be part of their healing. And also this economy of favors exchanging, like if, you, if you're friends of the shaman and you've, or the religious leader, you, you, you get certain privileges and you can have more status in the ritual and have a kind of higher um, influence in the group. So kind of seducing people with benefits related to sleeping or doing sexual favors, uh, so there's a whole spectrum of things from rape to just issues of consent. There's a large discussion on whether you can really consent, you know, relationship between a shaman and a participant. How long should you wait to have engage in that um, relationship? And, and another angle to this is, is to try to educate the, the shamans and the practitioners themselves because that's that involves a lot of cross-cultural challenges. I have heard this over and over again. Like, for example, uh, you know, a local Amazonian healer will say, well, I didn't abuse her because she wanted. She said she wanted. So <laughs> this idea of consent and this power differentials and this hierarchy that exists is, is something that is not often talked about. And so I recommend people... Uh, read the guidelines and yeah, do your research. Right. And then more generally with, with the phenomenon of ayahuasca tourism, I guess there's a lot uh, we could talk about there, but I, I, I read a paper of, of yours where you were talking about the, um, the kind of the dieta, the kind of uh, the dietary restrictions um, although I guess dieta can also refer to dieting plants, so that could be something different. But just the way that now, before going to an ayahuasca ceremony, you're supposed to avoid certain things like alcohol. And I think you opened the paper by talking about, I think it was like 100 years ago, a British anthropologist or uh, someone who, who tried ayahuasca and was immediately given a kind of glass of alcohol as well by the indigenous community. And just kind of illustrating that this isn't something that some ancient you know, phenomenon that that's um, consistent across all practices. Um, so yeah, what do, what are your thoughts on that on that kind of whole area? Yeah, this topic of dietas have really 
capture Westerners imagination. And there's almost like this competition of who is better in following their diet and uh, endless disputes and forums on the internet about trying to see, you know, can you eat banana or can you eat orange or, you know, can you have coffee or this and that. And people have spent hours of their time trying to figure out that and also trying to find biomedical um, roots to um, those explanations. So well, according to this study, there's a logic on why you can't use salt because of this and that, or if you have this kind of cheese, there's tryptamines. And uh, so, yeah, we as anthropologists, we, we try again to analyze this as social phenomena and to see the the history behind it and, and why do certain rules stick for some certain people and don't stick for others. And we also just invite a kind of bigger, wider, uh, critical thinking on the topic, which is different traditions have different diets as well. Um, so it's not something that is like an universal truth, but it makes sense for certain groups. And we encourage people to think critically about it, but also to get informed. I think it's very important to, to be connected to some kind of group. Uh, these things are strong and powerful, and it's not something so recommendable for you to do on your solo flight. They're really a collect part of a collective experience. Of course, people that are part of groups and that are initiated and have a lot of experience, they might have personal experiences then, but that's completely different from somebody that has no experience trying to have an experience alone and making all the shots, you know, uh, so I think um, the important thing is to be connected to some kind of group and follow that group's uh, lead and try to, to make sure that this group is a solid group. It's also not just one single individual that is going around and doesn't have any community anywhere, is not based anywhere, and is just like a, a shaman that is traveling to offer experiences for foreigners. Um, I think the main recommendation is really to ground this experience on a community and uh, look to the history of this community and different communities have different ways of dealing with the experience. And uh, you know, that's my take as an anthropologist. If we're in interviewing the leader of a certain group, he might tell you, well, that's the diet is this, this and that, and that's what you have to do. So um, that's not gonna be my answer for you. Right. And again, it's very interesting the way that, you know, the, the ceremonies that people can attend, um, they, there's an assumption of that they're the traditional way of doing things. But as you say, with the diet, maybe that's not the case. Um, but also the, I've done all my ceremonies with a, with a Peruvian ayahuasca caro who told me that in traditional use, uh, at least in his Shipibo community, it's the shaman who drinks the ayahuasca and the person who's coming to the shaman actually doesn't, um, and so I was, I was surprised by that, uh, uh, that. And he said that's kind of changed as, as Westerners have come and they expect to be able to drink it themselves. Do you see this kind of disconnect between the traditional use and the modern uh, way it's given to tourists? Well, there, there, it is true that there are cer certain traditions that the shaman uh, was the only one that drank. And then with the interest of foreigners, um, like our outsiders, because it's not just foreigners, but locals that are not from the jungle, uh, then others started to drink. But there are also other traditions where everybody drank. So that's, again, not an universal thing. I think there's certain, certainly something very interesting about all of this. I, I like to think with the contrast of psychedelic assisted therapies, where, you know, this therapist gives the substance to the person, but he won't take it. So let's say you have three kinds of scenario. One, only the therapist will take and the pa patient wouldn't take. The other is both the therapist and the patient take. And then the third one would be uh, only the uh, the patient takes and the therapist doesn't take. Uh, so that's also kind of interesting. If you look from a kind of traditional lenses, it's a bit weird treatment where your, uh, your doctor is not taking that together with you because the idea is that, as I said before, these plants are spirits and they have agency. They somehow 
uh, have intentionality, subjectivity, and they are deep inside like humans. They have their own culture. They have their own traditions, families, organization. And when you relate to these plants, and that's when you can get their teachings and um, also the kind of, you know, they're able to incorporate in you and their knowledge comes to you. So it's a kind of weird tradition where, you know, the therapist wouldn't take the substance. Only the person that, um, that is the patient take, takes the, the substance. And yeah, again, you know, I am an anthropologist. I'm not trying to be a healer. I'm not a psychedelic assisted therapist. But to me, I would feel much more comfortable going to a doctor that takes the substance than one that doesn't. You know, whether we could make this obligatory in the FDA, that's an entire different question. I'm talking just very abstract here in kind of, uh, uh, you know, generic um, terms, philosophical terms. Right. And you also mentioned uh, PRT conservation. I'd be interested to hear uh, what's going on in that area. Yeah, uh, peyote is probably one of the most contentious topics in the field because it's uh, it's a small cactus that is endogenous to the south of Texas and uh, north of uh, Mexico, so it only grows in certain par parts of the world. And maybe for a peyote to grow fully well, it will take 30 years or so. Uh, you know, you can have as soon as maybe 10 years, 7 years, but a whole peyote 30 years and it's, it's a fragile species. It's classified both in uh, U.S. and Mexico as an endangered species and also in the uh, International Convention of uh, Substances, I, of Plants. I, I forgot the, the name. But anyway, there's a classification, you know, into levels of, of danger like vulnerable, almost in extinction, in extinction, and uh, endangered or so. It's, it's, uh, it's known to be in decline, and there is just simply more people eating peyote than peyote's natural ability to regenerate. Also, there's just a lot of land development that are um, happening in, in peyote lands, such as big uh, mining companies or oil or um, monocultures. Uh, and aggressive extractivist practices that uh, damage the land and kill peyote. So both due to a personal human reach and through, you know, uh, non-mindful, aggressive, uh, capitalist land exploitation. Th between those two things, peyote is in real decline. Uh, and so there's a, gr a great concern about it. It's different than other species. Um, there's this particularity that there is a, an issue of conservation. And now it became also an issue in the United States as the Native American church, through its main organizations um, of representation, the Native American church, the Native American church of North America, uh, different, there's like four major uh, entities that represent the Native Americans in the U.S. have uh, issued an open letter to the psychedelic movement asking the psychedelic movement to pause and to listen and uh, asking the psychedelic movement to let the Native Americans lead the efforts of conservation and regulation of peyote in the United States and making a claim for the rights of sovereignty and the rights to determine uh, how to move the conversations forward with the government. So it has been a very, very dramatic, um, long battle around all of this. And now there's another chapter called the Plant Medicine, the Plant uh, Medicine Healing Alliance that is based in Portland, uh, that is advancing uh, the discussions around Measure 109 and 110, which uh, regulated psychedelic assisted therapy for psilocybin in Oregon and also decriminalization of all substances in Oregon. And so this group, um, I sit in the advisory board, uh, is, is trying to advance a decriminalization in, in, in ways that are mindful to Native Americans and also Black and Indigenous people of color 
and LGBTQA individuals. And so it's very vibrant. There are, there's a lot of things happening now in the United States in terms of decriminalization and conversations around con conservation and, and access and all of that.